bulletin there and follow along with me. But I want to speak for the next few minutes on uh, the best but in the Bible. Now, before you get offended and say, you shouldn't use that word, but, okay, remember, how many of you know what but is, the word but? Huh? It's, what, what part of speech is it? It's conjunction. But did you know it could be used for, for uh, adverb, noun? Did you know that? You probably didn't know that. But I looked it up and, and found out that it could be used more than just a conjunction, but we're going to use it in that fashion today. And uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the best but in the Bible. Are y'all crank me up here. Start air circle. There you go. Start me back there probably too. Are we up? Not coming up? Well, we'll go without it if we don't. If you don't get pictures, you'll, just have to, you'll have to listen. <laughs> I know you're a video generation, but anyway, you'll have to listen a little, little more intently if we don't have the pictures up there. I was reading this week and heard about this 80-year-old uh, codger that had saved his money up for a long time. And he was a little, a little older than Granddaddy. But uh, he, Granddaddy liked speed. And this particular guy loves speed. So he saved his money <coughs> and bought him a brand new L78 Corvette. Now, those are turbochargers and have the hottest motor that you can probably get in the production car today. And uh, he went and got this car and he paid for it, paid for it cash. Drove right out of the, the, the dealership, and he got out on I-75, and, and, and uh, Brother Jim wasn't working that day, but one of the other uh, highway patrolmen you know, noticed this, this old guy uh, flying by in his, in his Corvette, so he started following him, and, and the old guy didn't ever saw the, the highway patrol. He just he got out there, and he just romped it. And boy, he was running along at, a, at about 100, and he had, this, had the top down. It was, a, it was a convertible. He could feel the... The uh, air blowing the what hair he had left back across to the back of his head. And he said, man, this feels pretty good. And he punched it a little harder. Pretty soon he was 110. And pretty soon he, he was 120. And then he got 130. And he, he started getting, he said, man, this is the fastest I've ever been in a car. And, and the speedometer actually went faster than that. But he said, I better better kind of hold it here for a few minutes. So he looked behind him. And lo and behold, who do you think was there? Highway Patrol. Uh-oh. So he just stayed on it for two or three miles. He said, you know, this is stupid. I'm too old to be doing this and getting in trouble like this. So he pulled over and highway patrolman walks up to his car just shaking his head. He looks at the car and looks at the old guy and he says, I'll tell you what. He said, it's 4.30. I'm tired of writing reports today. He says, if you can tell me the best reason that you're going that fast that I've ever heard, I'm going to let you go today. And the old guy says, well, well, officer, it's like this. He said, 40 years ago, he said, my wife ran away with a highway patrol. He said, I thought you were trying to bring her back. <laughs> he said, good day, sir. You, you can go. That's the best you've ever done. Now, that wasn't, that wasn't my, my father. Now, he, he, has, he has always been a little bit of a speed freak. And one day he did get on a, a uh, I think it was a Kawasaki 1000 or something, big motorcycle anyway, one of the bigger, faster ones. And, Back in his day, he, he rode the old Harley type, he rode a Royal Enfield, which is a, an English made real hot uh, motorcycle back in the 50s. And uh, he had never been on these, what we call a crotch rocket, because these new rice burners are fast. And Dad got out here on, in front of 39th Avenue and he opened her up. And, and I'm telling you, by the time he passed in front of the building here, he was, he was running about 100. And just, he said it was all they could do to hold on, though, because he said the, the more he showered down, the faster it was going. So, but, uh, but that story wasn't about the Corvette wasn't my father, so he still got his precious bride after all these years. But uh, you can be turning in your Bibles this morning over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And I want to take you back for a minute into history. Uh, now, we've been talking about building this bridge of, of life principles, putting God's principles in place so that we can successfully navigate the deep waters of life, right? We've been, we've been going there, right? Yes. But before you see, see, lost people can even benefit from following God's plan. You believe that? How many of you think lost people can benefit by loving their families like they ought to? Yeah. I mean, of course, I think they can love them better and, and with more effect when they have Christ in them. But lost people can benefit by adding God's principles in their life. But that's not enough. And in, in, in order to really gain everything God wants for us to have in life and really to have the, these principles help us more and, and affect us more in our lives. We need Christ in our life. And so I wanted to kind of to uh, go today into the scriptures and talk about the best but in the Bible because it affects 
Everything about it, it affects your eternal destiny. It affects every part of your life. France in 1943 was occupied by the Nazis. And uh, the Nazis, as you know, were not, some, not a very nice people. And they started a, a program of, of extermination at that point and started exterminating the Jewish population from all over Europe. And they built some trains there in France called the Charitable, and they, and they labeled it Charitable Transport Company. Mm. Charitable Transport Company. And, and they sold this idea of relocating the Jewish people at first with, we're, we've got some, a better place for you, and we're going to take you to a, these real nice places for you to live, and we're going to take care of your health care needs, yes. and, and all those sort of things. They, they sold it as being good for the population, particularly the Jewish population. And, and when they first started loading these trains, the, the people would load up willingly because beautiful train, had charitable transport company written on it. They even had ambulances, gray ambulances with charitable transport ambulance on them. And they would pick up the older people that couldn't make it to the train and they would take them to these places to uh, have a better life, is what they were told. But you know where they were going, don't you? They were going to the gas chamber. And over 6 million Jews died during the Holocaust during World War II. And it all started out with trains that were <laughs> labeled charitable transport company. After a while, then, if you looked at the pictures from the Holocaust, it looked like cattle cars with wire on them after a while. And they were hauling, had they not had their rail system in place, they would not have been able to haul that many Jews to the gas chambers and murder them during World War II. I believe there's a parallel that exists with what happened in Nazi Germany and what's happening in the United States of America right now. I really do believe there's a parallel. Uh, it's bad enough when you look at where our government is taking us, but it's even worse that, that most of the population is loading up on the bandwagon and, and playing along in the band with them. <laughs> This is great. The first loads on those trains thought it was great too. But very soon they found out quite the opposite. America's, Americans are not only buying what our lying government is saying to us, but they're buying what the lies that Satan is telling them to do. So it's bad enough to believe politicians. You know how to tell when a politician's lying? <laughs> And they got their mouths open and talking. That's it. That's it. And I don't care what side of the aisle they come from. They both, <coughs> both sides lie. Uh, but Satan's a bigger liar than that. And he, and he has folks convinced on this earth that they're okay. He has people convinced that everything's going to be okay. You're fine. You're fine just like you are. You know, learn to accept your humanness. Relish in what you are. And, and people believe that. Why? Well, for the most part, they've rejected God's truth and what God's, God's Word says about who we really are and what we really are. Take your Bibles this morning and, and go to the book of Ephesians. And are we offline on that thing? You can't get it back up, right, guys? I'm going to ignore it if it's... Is it working or not working? I'm not going to... I'm, I'm going to just shut this part down if you're, if you're not on. Let me get up here one more time and try to give you one more shot here. Technology, anyway. We'll go with it. We won't worry about it. Go without it. Ephesians 2. Take your Bibles. Verse 1. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Let's begin with prayer as we think about the best but in the Bible. Lord, I thank you that this morning, Lord, that uh, you know everything about us, and Lord, you know even when our technologies don't work and things don't turn out like, we're, like we want them to, Lord, you've got another plan. So, Lord, I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to do my best to share your word and, and talk to my brothers and sisters today about your, your powerful effect on our lives 
If we just let you have your, have your way. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we said but is a conjunction, right? And it can be used in this. We have a grammar majors here and, and uh, teachers, and they, could, they would agree with me that uh, there are other ways that you can use it. But we're using it as a conjunction today. And uh, in the Bible text, we haven't gotten there yet, but the Scriptures talks about the, uh, the, where we are as human beings, our natural condition on planet Earth. When we're born into this world, we're born basically on the way to death. We start our lives, but we're going to die in 60 or 70, maybe, if we're lucky, 80 years. How many of you in here are over 70? Mm -hmm. You're on borrowed time, aren't you? Yep. The Bible promises us, a little, that then if you're lucky and you're, and you're healthy, 80, God established the pattern of dying at, at, below 100 anyway. Some people might live to be 100. We have some kin folks. How old was Miss, uh, your grandma when she passed? 103. 103, you know. It, but, but by the time she passed, she was getting herself in some trouble because her mind wasn't working quite right, you know. And one day when Gwen and them were gone, she called the, the, the uh, emergency people and uh, they thought that she'd been held by, captive by her family, kidnapped. And Gwen and them show up and there's the, all the emergency people there, you know. And what? Well, we got somebody to stay back because there's somebody being held captive here. They go, oh, that's not cat, that's grandma. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good thing that God doesn't let us live much longer than that because we don't, our minds don't quite work right, do they, at that point? But you know, one day all that will be solved when God gives us our new bodies and gives our brand new addition that doesn't age and doesn't deteriorate. Uh, I wish that we all could be in perfect health all the time, but God does not. I mean, He will heal us. I believe in Him. I got all in my pocket. Okay, I believe in it. But he doesn't heal everybody. And there is a time that you will leave this earth in death if the rapture doesn't occur first. Yeah. You know, we all will deteriorate and die because we're we're just getting older and, and we and we're breaking down, our bodies are breaking down. Uh, but our natural condition on planet Earth, Ephesians says here, he says, You were what? In verse one, you were what? you you are dead. Now I've got a brother here that's in the back, that brother Mickey, that has to deal with dead people. You deal with dead people all the time, don't you, brother? It's just a dead subject, isn't it, brother? And people are dying to go see brother Mickey all the time. Are you ready? Is that, is that, try to fix it. Okay. Try to fix it for me. You, are you going to mute it on the screen up here so they, you won't flash? Don't flash it up here in my face because it kind of distracts me. You can do that. I'm, t I'm ADD, you know how that is. You can't be flashing too many stimuli in front of me without me changing my direction. That is true. But we're, we're, hey, listen, the Bible that. says our natural human condition what? is we're dead. You know, we, we are in a dead condition. You say, I don't feel dead. I'm not dead. I'm alive. I don't live. You know, I do too. But the Bible says spiritually, dead. We're, dead. Yeah, we're dead. You know, we spiritually, we need Brother Mickey to come pick us up. Take us and make us look halfway. He does a pretty good job by making you look good after you're dead, by the way. You know, he can kind of dress you up and paint you up. But the, I've never seen anybody yet climb out on them caskets. Have you, Brother Mickey? The only one that ever has is Jesus Christ. And he came back after three days being in the grave. So he got me fixed. Well, look at there. Praise God. Come on, bring it up here. Let me play with that thing. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. My wife says, oh, no, not a gadget. Thank you, brother. All right, let's go back to dead. Get a dead one. Here we are. Dead? Are we dead? We're dead. There we go. And we're in the condition. We need to, we need to, uh, we, we're pretty bad. We need some meat on our bones, don't we? And no matter how much we fix ourselves up, no matter how much we paint ourselves up, no matter how much we tune ourselves up, in reality, the Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Now, that doesn't mean you're physically, your heart's not working and we're not breathing air. No, it means that spiritually you can't do anything worth three cents when it comes to spirituality between you and God. You're dead. There's nothing you can do to please God because we are in a bad way. Did you know there are over 250 psychotherapies out there trying to fix people today? Psychotherapy is, I mean, all sorts of, of psychologists and psychiatrists and people that want to give you some sort of therapy or give you some sort of drugs. And let me ask you a question. Which one's right? 
out of those 250, which ones are right? No, no. <laughs> you, know what, you know what psychology really is? You have a medical doctor here, and you have the spiritual doctor, the pastor over here, and you have a whole new group of people that got right in the middle and said, talk to us, we can fix you. No, they can't. No, they can't. Listen, only God can fix our problem Amen. of being dead. Only God can make us alive again. Only God can fix the, the problems we have on the inside. And each and every one of you, you have someone in your family that has had some sort of treatment sometime, and, and they've, had, they've given us therapy, they've given us counsel, and they've given us drugs, and guess what? They still haven't fixed us. There's only one that can fix us, and that's God. And the Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins. Not only that, it says we were directed by Satan. And I don't like Satan. I don't, I, you know, I never have. But you know what? When we're not on God's team, when we're not pulling in God's direction, when we're not serving on God's, in God's family, we are on the Satan's team. Whether we are willingly uh, compliant with him or not is, is irrelevant. The Bible says we're directed by him. And not only that, each and every one of us wants to please us. I like me a little bit. I don't know if you like me. Do you like you a little bit? How many of you got up this morning and did something for yourself? We all did. I got up and I made the first thing I did. I got a bottle of water and I get my coffee. I like my coffee. We got one of those little fancy coffee makers too. That you, we got them one cup of meals. Amen. There, that's good. Good coffee. But the first thing I did, first thing, when I go and get ready to do my quiet time, I go first to the, turn that little brew on, brew it. And I can pull my water out. And then by the time it gets ready to go, I'm ready to go in and start studying the scripture. But see, I did that for self. I, I, I gratified myself before I did anything. Made myself feel good by drinking that coffee and drinking that water. You see, we're all like that. That's the way God made us. We are, we are desiring fleshly gratification. But see, we take that, most people, all of us, take it to the extreme. Little babies especially. Why are they crying? What are they screaming for? Feed me! Change my pants! Get over here, woman! I'm wet! Get me out of these nasty diapers! Why, why are we like that? Well, we desire fleshly gratification. We're dead. And when it comes to spiritual things, we can't please God. We're dead. We're just as dead as a, a, a corpse over at Mickey Mouse's funeral. When it comes to doing things for God and, and being spiritual, we can't be because we're dead. Plus, we, we want to do our own thing. We want to just please ourselves. Plus, we got the devil behind us pushing stuff in front of us all the time. Hey, try this. Hey, you ever try this, dude? Uh, I was like, try this. This will really get you high here, dude. Uh, you know, we like to please ourselves anyway, so what do we do? We're following along right with his plan. And then the Bible says we are doomed. It says by nature, verse 3, we're children of wrath. Just as the others. Think about it for a minute. We are doomed. We have no chance of turning around. We have no hope in the world of turning our life around. We can't fix ourselves. We can't clean ourselves up. We're not going to get off like the 80-year-old guy with the, the highway patrolman letting him go. No, because there's a, a righteous, holy God that's going to hold people accountable for their sins. You see, we don't talk a whole lot about accountability these days. And children... And, and people are not raised with the idea that they're going to answer for what they're doing. Listen, that's the problem we have. We need to teach young people, you're accountable for your actions. One of the best therapies that I think was uh, secular therapies that was ever devised was called reality therapy. And you ought to read, read that sometimes. But for a non-Christian therapy, it worked pretty good because the guy started asking or making prisoners and people that were in trouble accept responsibility for their own actions. Go figure. Yeah. Duh. I learned that in the first grade or before. My mama made me accept responsibility for what I did wrong. Huh? You see, we're supposed to accept responsibility. And, and this secular psychologist, he, he, really, he really hit on a pretty good deal and, and had some pretty good success with helping people turn their lives around to a certain extent. But you folks, listen to me. In the end, no matter how many therapies there are out there, no matter how many sessions you go to, no matter how many psychiatrists you go to, no matter how many doctors you go to, no matter how many drugs you take, we're still doomed. We're still dead in trespasses and sins unless 
someone's in, someone higher than us intervenes. And that's where the best but in the Bible comes in. It, and it really find it down there in verse 4. Who did this? Well, look at verse 4. But who? But who? God. But who? God. But who? God. But God. Think about it for a minute. But God. But God. Now I want you to read it with me a little different. I want you to read, but God is. Don't read anything else but that. Okay, read that for me one time. But God is. Folks, listen to me. He is whether you want him to be or not. Francis Schaeffer, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, who's now in heaven, he wrote a book uh, a long time ago. Uh, about God, and, and he was a great apologist for the faith. Apologist does not mean that you, you're apologizing for the faith. It means a great defender of the faith. And he wrote a book, The God Who Is There. And he, and he shows you all through history and through everything around the world how that God has revealed himself. He's there. But God is. And whether or not we want to acknowledge it or not, there is a God. His name is Jehovah. <laughs> there, he, he has revealed himself in the pages of the Scripture. And he holds people accountable for their sins. There is a God, but God is. Now, what's the next word? But God who is? So. Say it one time. But God who is? Rich. Rich. Say it one more time. But God who is? Rich. Rich. But God who is? Rich. Rich. Hey, listen to me. My daddy's rich. If he's your daddy, your daddy's rich. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the gold under the hills. He's the creator of God. He's the one that made all this stuff in the first place. But God, who is rich, <laughs> the rich God, not the poor God, but the rich God. So you might not be very rich, but if you know God and he's your daddy, your daddy's rich. Yes. And that means a lot for you in your future. You're, but God, who is, and, but God, who is rich. Now, read, it, read the next verse, next word. But God, who is rich in... Mercy. Say it one time. But God who is rich in mercy. But God who is rich in mercy. Man, aren't you glad he's a merciful God? He's not only wealthy and owns everything, but he's also rich in mercy. Listen, the last thing people need when they're on a one-way street going the wrong way is people screaming and yelling at them and hanging a finger out the window at them and cussing them. What they need is someone to stop traffic and say, hey, whoa, whoa, let me, let me help you turn around here, bro. <laughs> they stop traffic and, all right, turn around, keep going the right way here. See, that's the last thing we need is someone screaming and telling us we're, we're in sin and we're wrong. Most of us know that. There's some people that deny their sin, there's, but a whole lot of people are going through life with, with a, their head hanging down and the guilt on their shoulders because... They don't think there's a, anybody that loves them. They think they've gone too far. They think they've, they've sinned too much. And there's nobody in the universe that loves them or cares. And brothers and sisters, let me just say this to you. That's going to be further from the truth. Because, but God who is rich in mercy. Aren't you glad we have a God that's rich in mercy? Amen. And, he, and he allows people to do new turns. Folks. Sometimes we, we, miss, we miss the whole point. It's not about the stained glass corridors and how well we look when we come on Sunday morning and how beautiful our building is or how much money are in the coffers. What it's all about is about the mercy of a loving Father who allows sinners like us to repent and turn away from our sins and turn to Him. But God who is rich in mercy. mercy. Then what's it say? But God who is rich in mercy and he loves. Say it one time. And he loves. Aren't you glad God loves you? You see, you don't even love yourself because you wouldn't do the things you do to yourself if you loved yourself. People wreck their lives. People mess up. But God who is rich in mercy and his love. I'm so thankful there is a Heavenly Father that loved us so much that he, he died on the cross for us. He was rich in his mercy and his love. And when did he do this? Well, what does verse 5 say? Somebody read verse 5. What does it say? I'll put it up here. Read it up here. This is New, New Living Translation. You King James people, don't get mad at me. 
Uh, might just be too plain for you in English, so but you know, go ahead and read it in your King James. I've got my King James right here, but but I'm gonna put it in English up there so we can don't be too mad at me and be offended. <laughs> Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Hey, you go, brother. <laughs> when did he do it? When did God do this? When did he show his mercy and his 2, love? 2,000 years ago. And what, when, though? In our lives, when? when, we when? Did, he wait, did he wait till we got better? No. Did he wait till we turned over a new leaf and cleaned our lives up? And no. came to Countryside Baptist Church, walked down the aisle, jumped in the baptistry? No. No. He did it while we were still in our sins. Yes. That's good news. Huh? I don't know about you. I like that. And, and, and how did he do it? Look at verse 6. How do you do this? Says so somebody read this out loud. It's up here. Read behind me. Can somebody read it. I don't care who. Take off and read. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. How did he do it? Well, he raised Jesus up from the dead, didn't he? Anyone that could raise a dead person up, well, Mickey, you'd be out of business, wouldn't you, brother? Would have been, you'd say, don't don't bring him yet, brother. <laughs> but, Listen, one day, Mickey will have to go out of business because there won't be any death anymore. You know, thank God for people like him now because they, they per per perform such a wonderful service for families. And they're there when we need them to take care of our loved ones when they pass on. But one day, we'll be raised from dead just like Jesus was. And, and Jesus does that now. And our spiritual, the spiritual part of us that was dead in trespasses and sins, we were desiring nothing but fulfilling our own satisfaction. We were following Satan. We were doomed. And God says, but. You're right? Uh, <laughs> but the God who's rich in mercy and love steps in. You see, that's an important but in the Bible. Isn't it? But, but God. But God intervened in your life. But God intervened in my life. But God intervenes in anybody's life that will, will open their lives up to Him. And, and through resurrection power, He's able to change us and make us different. He's able to, to change our sinful hearts. And he, and he takes the old sinful heart and gives us a, a heart of flesh and full of the Spirit of God. And He dwells in that. That's, that's just so mind-boggling to me that this God that, that is so powerful does that for us. And why? Why does He do this? Well, look at verses 7 and 10. Look at verse 7. Somebody read it. Read it out loud. Up here. Read, read it in yours or read it out loud. I don't care. Read it. Go ahead. Through us, through us, in all future ages of the examples of the incredible wealth and the grace of kindness, the Lord has shown all he has done for us in our United Christ Jesus. Wow. That's phenomenal. Isn't it? Phenomenal. Think about it. Why did he do? Why did he save somebody like you? Like him. <laughs> like the like you were, the story you're talking about. Like that old guy. Or like this old guy. Why did he do that? He says, one day, you're going to be my trophies. Mm -hmm. He's like, you never thought of yourself as a trophy, did you? You probably thought nobody, nobody ever ever even think of anything about you. He thought, I'm nothing. I'm just dirt. No, you're not. No, you're not. You've been bought with a price. You've been paid for by the blood of the Son of the living God. And he loves you very much. And you're his trophy. And he says, someday, in the ages to come, I'm going to show you off. When people look back and they see what happened here, he's going to say, here's one of them. <laughs> he's going to hold up them Scarborough brothers and say, check these guys out. Wow, look what I did way back when. Those guys, they were on their way to hell and I rescued them <laughs> and saved them and put them in my family. Look what they did for me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Go take, oh, Candace is not here today, but go take Candace one day. Candace used to be Candace Bass, now Candace Parker. Hold Candace up and go, Look what I did. Candace was on her way to hell working the Cypress Lounge in Gainesville. And I saved her because I loved her. I rescued her. She's my wonderful trophy of grace. Check it out, guys. <laughs> he says, in the ages to come, he's going to hold us up. And, and we're going to be his trophies of grace. But I'll tell you what. I, I love it when... When the down and outers come, I like it when the up and outers come. I don't care who comes, as long as they come to Christ and they and they let God change their lives and, and God puts them on His trophy shelf over there in the in the other building. If you haven't been over there, we have a trophy case and, and all through there, 
there are, there are, there are things that point back to our glory years in the Florida High School Activities Association. We, we still win some. But we had some glory years that, are, that we're real proud of. And we went through a, a run, didn't we, Jimmy, back in the, the 90s there where we won regionals in softball six times, I think, six or seven times, or, or district six or seven times, re regionals three or four times. Went to the final four in the state of Florida. Got all kind of plaques, and, and we got some jerseys there. Why do we do that? Because we remember how God used those girls, and, and he put us in high places. But you know what? Those trophies are nothing compared to what you're going to be wanting. Yeah. When Jesus holds you up and he shows you to the entire universe and says, look what I bought. Right. These are mine. Yeah. Aren't you proud how beautiful they are? And folks will shine forever and ever with it. And it's not because of how good we are or what we've done. It's because of the great, wonderful, awesome grace of the living God. And, you know, how do we get that? Well, in verses 8 and 9, says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So here's how the, the English, or English, modern English says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. Listen, you're created in him. He's, he did the work. We put so much emphasis on what we did for God. Listen, if he didn't step in and save you, you'd be on your way to hell still. And God reached down in his wonderful, awesome grace. And he, and he grabbed you and snatched you right out of the burning flames of hell. Because that's where you would have ended up. For, if you hadn't, hadn't listened to him and hadn't responded to him. Somebody has, has identified or, or written an acrostic for grace. And I think it's on your outline there. But God's riches at Christ's expense. Isn't that good? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's not something we could do. It's not something that we could purchase. Something he purchased with his own blood. And we are his workmanship, if you read a little further in that scripture, created in Christ Jesus under good works. And every single time you do something out there on the earth, in the name of Jesus, for his kingdom, God's keeping score. And his kingdom is getting the glory. And, and his name is being lifted up and magnified. And, and his wonderful plan is once again being shown to a lost and dying world. And look what God can do with just an ordinary person that responds to his call. You see, the reward for following this butt... <laughs> By the way, do you think it's the best button in the Bible? How many of you think, now you think you understand why I'm saying, now you might find another button later that might be better, but this is the best one I've ever seen in the Bible. And you can understand why it's the best button, because it's the conjunction that brought, brought us into the great family of God and, and it's established our feet and our lives and our hearts upon the rock, the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reward for, for following this, there's a, there's a few of them. One of them is the fact that you're delivered now. You're, you're delivered from a, a Christless eternity in which people have to go to hell. You're delivered from the power of sin over your life. You're not delivered from the presence of sin because we still have to fight the, the rest of these football games out. You know, there, there are a lot of battles to still be fought, but you are delivered from the power of sin. You don't have to obey it like you used to. You can't overcome it in this life. And Will you ever be perfect? I don't think you'll be perfect in this life, but positionally, God looks at you as if you're already there. So you've been delivered from the power of sin. Not the presence of sin, but you have been delivered from the power of sin. You can say no, and you can overcome it with God's help. You have been delivered from the, the payment for sin, because you will never have to go to, to hell for your sin. You will never, ever have to stand before God and, and stand there stripped with everything else off of you but your sin and answer to God for that. Why? Because God placed upon His own Son your punishment for sin. And He took your punishment. So you're delivered from those things the moment you believe. Second thing is, you're, you're deposited. Mm -hmm. Just like you would deposit money in a bank and you put earnest money up, a down payment on your home, and, and they would hold that house for you. Jesus has deposited you already in heaven with Him. It's as if you're already there. 
I've heard Jerry Falwell and others say, are you as sure for heaven as you've been, been there 10,000 years? And, and I can say with, a, with an astounding, oh, absolutely, brother. And you should be able to. Why? Because you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies right now. You're already there when it comes to positionally where you're going to end up when you, when you die and leave this earth. He has deposited you there. And if you go on and read more into this, this wonderful book of Ephesians and, and the book of Galatians, it talks about Him sealing you with His Holy Spirit of promise. God has not only, has, has, uh, has not only uh, delivered you, but He's deposited you with His, His Heavenly Father. And we're seated at the right hand with Jesus right now. We still have to live our lives out. We have to fight these battles. But know this for sure. You're already deposited there. And not only that, the reward is that you're going to you're displayed with him, and you're going to be displayed throughout all history as one of his wonderful trophies of grace. Aren't you glad God loves you and wants to, to show you off a little bit? Amen. Man, I love it. When we go places and Ms. Monty dresses up, man, she gets all her jewelry and gets all her pretty dress on, puts all the makeup on, gets her hair done, and we go out, you know, and I'm like, oh, man. And then people are thinking, how did that old ugly guy get somebody like her, you know? But it makes me feel good to think, well, I get to walk somewhere with my bride, you know? She's looking fine, you know? God loves us so much more than that. And, and he, he loves us. He wants to display us as, of His wonderful grace and His wonderful love throughout of all. We're, oh, by the way, you know where the bride of Christ goes? Think about that. Bible that talks about the church being the bride of Christ. It says, who has adorned herself with, with white linen, spot, beautiful and clean. Jesus loves us and, he, and he's going to display us one day as this wonderful, beautiful, spotless bride. For to me, there's nothing prettier than a bride. How many of you like brides? You know, we, we men don't get into the all the bride shows like women do, but you know what? There's, there's nothing any prettier than a bride when she starts down that aisle with you. And, and there's a hush falls over the crowd. And they start that music. Everybody stands up. They're looking back. And, and the groom, he's about to pass out. He's up there with me. And he's holding on to the preacher, you know. He sees his bride coming to the door. And he's like, oh, man, wow. You know. Think about God displaying us as his bride. And one day the bride will come and enter the bridegroom chamber. It won't be long. We'll be at the, the wedding feast. See, once the wedding's over and they take the pictures and we've had all that, and we always, it's all just like, ah, finally over, you know, and everybody's relaxing, you know, and where do, where do we go then? We go for where? We go back there and get something to eat. We have a big old party, don't we? I mean, we party down, you know. And even some Baptists, you know, we're, we're old Baptists, we don't have any fun or dance or anything like, like that, but. You know, even some Baptists dance when they have weddings. Why? Because it's a joyous time, you know. We're having fun. Why? Because we are displaying God's greatness and what He's done. And God's going to display us one day. You see, we have a destiny. We're destined to be with God. We're destined to live in heaven forever. We're destined to be part of the royal family. We're destined to be the bride of Christ. It's our destiny. And when we follow Christ, when we when we when we let that conjunction interfere with our life, I wouldn't say interfere. When we let that conjunction enter our life, and we take part in what happens after the conjunction there in chapter in verse four, and we allow God to do what He wants to do in our life, we inherit all these rewards. And but you know what? There's a penalty for not not listening. What happens to those that don't want to obey God and Amen. they don't want to let the conjunction interfere with their life and they don't want to, to, to really meet the God who is there and the God who is rich and the God who is merciful and the God who is merciful and, and shows His love toward us when they don't want to meet Him and they don't want to turn their lives over to Him and they want to stay in rebellion against Him what happens? Well, folks, it's France, 1943, all over again. And all they're doing in modern-day America, when they, don't, when they don't follow Christ, and they don't follow the book, and they reject God's Word, and they reject the Son of the living God, all they're doing is they're getting on the death train. That's right. They're loading up, and they're headed for the gas chambers that 
where Satan is going to be thrown by the way too. He'll be thrown out of there. And, and folks, it's time to get off the train to hell. That's right. Listen, nobody here should have any excuse for going to hell because you've had a, a young man, well, not so young, an older guy with white hair on a Sunday morning tell you about Jesus and how much he loves you. Amen. And all through the, the history of the church, every Sunday, every Sunday night, on Wednesday night, in the revivals, on the radio, across the internet, in tracks, on movies, on TV shows, you've heard the same message about the great love of Christ. And you heard it again this morning when, when our precious story lady told us about John 3.16 once again. We've heard it, and yet there are people that still hold back. Let me just encourage you, don't hold back today. If that's your case, if you haven't come across yet, and you haven't gotten off the train to hell, it's time to get off of it. Because if you don't get off that train, you're going to end up in hell with, with Satan and his angels. And it's time to get on board the heaven-bound train now. You say, how do you do that, preacher? What do you do to get on the heaven-bound train? Well, number one, you realize that you're a sinner, and you can't save yourself. There's nothing you could ever do enough religiously or, or enough good works to ever get yourself to heaven. You can't do it. We can't make it that way because Ephesians just told us we're dead in trespasses and sin. We have to go to the verse 4 where it says, but God. See, God intervened and he, and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. And he offers each and every one of us a free trip to heaven. And all we have to do to get it is, in simple faith, reach out and take that free gift. God says, I'm giving it to you. I bought it. I paid for it. You can't do anything to get it except reach up and in simple faith take it. And many years ago, this old beggar reached up and I took that free gift. And I claimed it as my own. Now, I don't, I've served the Lord for a long time, but I still don't deserve that gift. I could, I've preached for, since 1976, off until I started in college then to be a preacher. I still haven't done enough to earn that. And never will my whole life. My daddy's been in the ministry since 1952. He still hasn't done enough to earn that gift. The only way Pastor Gene Keith or Pastor Bill Keith or anybody else is ever going to get there, ever going to make it into heaven, is when we accept God's payment for sin that Jesus bought for us a long time ago. Now let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And I don't know who this was actually meant for because I wasn't aiming or I was, this was a shotgun approach by the Holy Spirit. And he's just putting his word out there for you today. And you have to decide as if this is meant for you or not. Have you, as, a, as an individual, come to the place where you personally have trusted Christ to forgive your sins and to give you eternal life? If not, then you need to do that today. This is, this is your time. This is your place. It's all about you right now. It's, this is between you and the Holy Spirit of a wonderful, loving Heavenly Father. The same God who is rich mercy and love. And he's, he's reaching down right now. The Bible says, he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and I will fellowship with him and he with me. God's looking for an entrance into your life right now and I would just encourage you as I pray this sinner's prayer in a moment, I would encourage you to do the same thing. Pray a prayer like this in your heart between you and God right now. Pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And Lord, I know if I'm left to myself, I'll never turn away from my whole life and I'll never turn to you. But Lord, today I believe what the pastor said. I believe what the word says that you love me so much. And you were so rich in your mercy and love. You, you sent your son to die for me. And I believe that. And I believe he died for me. And today I want to turn my life over to you and accept you as my Savior and my Lord and live for you for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're going to have a little song now. And, and, and we're